everyone to a moving and transformative episode of Hashtag Tell Me Your Story podcast. I'm your host Danielle and I'm Rhiannon and today we have the privilege of sitting down with a truly remarkable guest. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ben Butler. Ben's journey is one that defies the odds, a journey of redemption, resilience and unwavering determination. From a turbulent childhood to being entangled in the darkness of prison, knife crime, violence and drug abuse, Ben's past is a testament to the challenges he faced. Welcome, Ben. Hi. Welcome. Cheers. You all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Thank you. You? Great to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm good. No, I appreciate it. Really do appreciate it. Well, Ben, thank you for being here today. Your journey of overcoming adversity is truly inspiring. Can you take us back to the your early life and share some of the challenges you faced to get where, where you are today? Yeah, so... Um, I think my early childhood, it was based around, <clears throat> I think, um, living in um, a white sort of town, uh, brought up by a white family, but not having sort of any sort of um, identity. I didn't know any black side of my family, so I grew up with a lot of uh, racism, bullying, um, sort of not knowing where to fit in. A lot of the time I used to try and um, scratch my skin and try and turn it white. Um, I'd sort of um, not really like the own colour of my skin. Um, so I think that was a big part of myself growing up. And then um, I think getting involved with uh, the wrong sort of crowd um but i think getting getting involved in the wrong sort of crowd was me trying to find a sort of a place to fit in in society because I, I didn't really have um a place to fit in and then obviously that come along with drugs um i think the first person one of the first people that i used to hang around with was um a racist himself um he had like a swastika tattooed on his hands and skins tattooed all over his forehead and his kids we used to go around um taking drugs i think that was when the first time me and my friends had seen um a kid his daughter i think she was on heroin but she was on the bed i think she was like 13 and we were just sat on the edge of the bed and um, we d were just smoking weed and that, but we just thought that was normal. But I think that was a lot, I think. But I, after a while, I think we've just become numb to a lot of things that were going on. And then the, the abuse that I was getting from in, that, in the household, like my mum and her partner. So I think a lot of abuse, a lot of violence and a lot of racism sort of was the start of where I ended up becoming um, because it's an identity crisis yeah. then doesn't it and yeah. that's when you go out into the world trying to find somewhere to belong a group to belong with and that's when you're vulnerable then to falling into the wrong crowd and even though I didn't experience the same issues with you I can totally like relate to what you're saying there because yeah. you you're lost and you're impressionable when you're a teenager as well aren't you so yeah like I all my like I didn't have we I didn't have much money at all. Like my family didn't like my mum. Now she she's doing very well for herself in terms of money and being successful. But growing up, like we had nothing. Like getting washed and bathed in a, in a sink, and then live. I used to live in a sleeping bag at my nan's with my mum and stuff in the living room. So like I grew up with nothing. So when I used to go to school and stuff, like everything um we didn't really have i always used to have like am i allowed to swear on it yeah of course yeah so i used to have like, <laughs> i used to have like the shit bread like like brown bread and tesco value like kit kats do you remember them and yeah no frills crisps and stuff like that yeah like i and then the shoes weren't the best i remember i think they were pods or something like that so like i used to go to school and plus, my mum never knew how to, like, um, she never used to know how to dress a black person because I had 
like afro hair, but it was cut like really wavy and curly. But like I used, to, she used to like moose the back of my hair, like my hair. So I used to look like a, a Jamaican Asian. Do you know what I mean? I used to look like something that had gone wrong. Like so, I was never. I never used to have like cocoa butter or cream, so my kneecaps and arms were always like I used to like, quite dry skinned and that. And then my mum, so my dad um, was involved in um, uh, drug dealing and torture and stuff like that. So he had get, got with my mum. I think my mum was quite an impressionable young girls I think she was about 17 18 and then he had like slept with her and then he sort of just wasn't really interested at the time um had numerous amounts of women on the go and I think that's where my, my me, me and my sister aren't so far off I think we're about nine ten months off so he was also in a relationship with my sister's mum as well um and then my mum raised me and then she met her boyfriend or fella at the time. And that's how we sort of yeah. was raised into like the white side of the family. So she, she had took no, me one, yeah, no she, one to influence you at no. all and on culture or anything, or even down to no, your hair and skin and No, I didn't even know anything about jerk chicken until I was like in prison. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> Yeah, did you missed out on that, didn't you? For yeah. yeah, I missed out on a lot of things, and I think yeah, definitely. Even yeah. to this day, I'm still like, um, when I watch stuff on YouTube, I'm still trying to think, like when they talk about certain like Jamaican things, I'm like, oh, what's that? So I like Google it and stuff. Do you know what I mean? But I think if I was raised culturally into my sort of heritage. Um, as well as obviously the white side of the family, I would probably be a bit more of a rounded person, but I'm, I think I'm a bit more of a damaged person more than anything. Definitely. And and my father is Indian and my brother, it was me and my mum and my brother and my brother is dark skinned. Yeah. And he's just, he's not like really dark, but you, he was diff he looked different to us. And so he always felt separated from us growing up. Yeah. yeah. And like, he did. It was me and my mum. We had a very close relationship. And then it was him and his. our dad didn't bother with him. And that would have been like the only black male he would have had in his life. And he, like to this day, he still, he has mental health issues. He's homeless. He's on drugs. Do you know what I mean? And he struggles with his identity because of it. And I watched him go through that for years. Um, and it wasn't until like a few years on that I realised. And I, I, I put two and two together like and figured out like that, how difficult that must have been for him growing up without anyone to identify with and relate to. So, like, I can I can totally understand how that could set you on a path, the wrong path, because it did it to my brother as well. Yeah, it's, um, I think, especially when it's hard enough growing up in an abusive household and having a lot of stuff going on, having no dad or whatever anyway, but, like, growing up and then sort of like I think I grew up thinking I was getting abused by the white side of my family and the black side of my family didn't want me so I had sort of I didn't really know where I could fit in anywhere do you know what I mean so yeah definitely and so where's that sorry well, go on I think I struggle now to this day I think I always question people's sort of motives on on things but I think that is that's I think a lot of that is due to like my trust issues in relationships and that because the people that you trust you should be your mum and your dad but they're the ones that sort of shit on me. Yeah and I suppose that would damage any yeah. trust, trust issues with anybody then because they're supposed to be your protectors and your carers aren't they so if you don't if you don't build those relationships with your parents early on and have that stable relationship it's going to have an effect on your relationships yeah. going forward isn't it yeah it's yeah. mad so after you was introduced to the drugs and stuff like yeah. where did it go from there um oh, it, it went wild i think um i think from i started smoking weed when i was about 
11 or 12 and then I started selling weed and then I think I went from weed and then I quadruple drops on pills, four pills at this bloke's house, um, which sent my head like west. And then I got introduced to certain people that knew that I was going through an abusive sort of household or relationships with my family and all that. And I was getting in, I was always carrying a knife and stuff and I was getting in trouble on the estates. And then the um, cocaine was pushed onto me. And then I started selling coke. And then I start, it went from like, I started selling like little bits, like from eights to quarters. And then it went from half ounces to ounces to uh, bars of, of coke. And then it went on to crack. Um, I think I sold heroin a couple of times. I can't remember. I knew I had heroin on possession. Um, and then, yeah, and then it ended up, I started selling that MCAT. Um, it just, yeah, as soon as it started from weed, I stole, I sold weed, coke, crack, and I think a bit of heroin. Um, and then obviously started taking, I took every single one of them drugs at some point. Uh, cocaine was the one that I was very much um, addicted to. Um, I think I had my first epileptic fit on cocaine. One of my ex-girlfriends had died. My mate was going out with her and she had ended up having a drug overdose on MDMA and I was selling um, coke. And then I sniffed a quarter of coke in about 45 minutes and then ended up in Austin. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, I was sat in the kitchen and I was just shoveling it up my nose and it went within 45 minutes and then I ended up in hospital. It? Total self-destruct mode. Yeah. Yeah, when I get in self-destruct mode, I go self-destruct. Like, yeah, yeah, that's the way that I used to do it. Like, go up, You go in, you go all in. Like, there wouldn't all be in, no yeah. half measures with that. And I think that's what the problem is half the time, isn't it? Because you yeah. don't know when to stop when you do fall into that 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 habit yeah i've got an addictive personality and uh, i'm sort of of even violent i'm addicted to violence as well so like i've i think it's program it's programmed into me to if i've got a conflict or got something that i need to sort out if i'm not happy with it i would i prefer to use violence but it's taken years of counselling and like obviously my daughter being born and my twins being born to know that that's not the best way. Don't but that me. was that was learned behaviour, wasn't it? Like you grew up with in, in violence. Do you know what I mean? That's all you've seen, and that's yeah. then your way of communicating because that's how you that's were shown. You, it's meant to see monkey do, isn't it? And, yeah. and then things sort of then regenerate from generation to generation. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And it's like me, I could never speak about my emotions because we didn't talk about that stuff in my household. So the only way I knew to communicate was I would leave it and leave it, something that was pissing me off, and then I'd explode and it would come yeah. out in the nastiest way possible because I didn't know how to sit down and have a conversation about it, isn't it? And it's, I suppose, they're the sort of skills that you learn when you do go on that journey then in the end, isn't it? Yeah. yeah of course. Like, I, I think I, I used to do a lot of, I used to build up a lot of like anger and resentment towards anything. And then um, it used to be the slightest thing used to trigger me. And then I'd end up either taking it out on someone that I loved or taking it out on someone that I didn't like. And it would be possibly for the the smallest thing. So did you um, end up doing any time in prison? Yeah, I... Um, Spent a couple of years in Stoke Heath. Um, Stoke Heath for me wasn't even I a lot. I enjoyed prison, and I'm not going to lie. Um, it was a break away from the life, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, and I ended up, and I still speak to a couple of people that I was in prison with. One's in prison still now, but not. But he had, he's taken his own sort of life journey. But these two people sort of protected me. They're, 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 
as you would be called, as you would say, gangsters. They they were involved in some dark stuff. But these lads raised me, um, and I sort of learned about my culture and heritage in prison. Unfortunately, there's a lot of black people in prison. So, like, I learned a lot about my culture and heritage, and they took me under their wing. And not only did I obviously learn about my heritage, I learned that I had obviously other, other networks and connections in prison. And some of these lad, young lads at the time knew my dad. And then I realised that my dad wasn't this small-time sort of person and then realised that my family weren't even a small-time family. Like, that, there's a lot of people in my family that... I didn't know were sort of big, big heads or big fish or whatever you call it. But I never sort of took their reputation of some family name. But I was looked after in prison. Obviously, at the start, I was I had to sort of make a name for myself because that's what you've got to do. Yeah. Uh, but I enjoyed, like you said, the break. Um, yeah, being in, not having to worry about anything, having routine, yeah. having structure. Yeah. In it and it's mad because I used when I used to go into prison, it'd be like a break away from the shit life, and it'd be like coming up to release date, it'd be like, oh, here we go back out into the crap now. Do you know what I mean? And he, yeah. you used to dread release day, not and not wait for it. Like I used to hate it. Yeah, I was. I when I I remember the day I was getting released, and I sort of I sort of was gutted um, because I had my set routine, like I knew my education, knew my um, gym. Um, I was doing all right in education as well. Um, and I had friends, even though <laughs> people on the outside world would question them sort of friends, but these friends for, for two years sort of um, moulded me for me coming back out onto the streets because um, it was harder coming back out than it was before I went in. And when I come back out, I think I created, I, I was, I did more crime than I did when I got out of prison and got away with it than I did before. And um, so do you think that you was, you got upskilled when you was in there? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it is something that happens, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, you go in there and and you do learn, and it's it's about that wanting to belong thing again, isn't it? Because you're still having dealt with those issues from your childhood and your past, and you're still trying to find a place to belong. So when you you found that place and you found people that are accepting you, and also you're learning about yourself and your culture and everything else, so you got that yeah. bond with them then, regardless of what they did on the outside. You're all human while you're in there, isn't it? And you do make them connections, regardless of what they've done outside. So to fit in and belong there, then. You're obviously going to learn then and upskill and, and talk and have them conversations, aren't you? And that's what most people actually get out of prison these days is just a, a simple upskilling. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. I got, I think, the la my mates, when they went to prison, they we all went to the same prison. A few went to Brinsford and that. Um, but a lot of us went to Stokey's. But, like, they didn't mix with many people. Whereas I mixed with like a lot of gangs and stuff. So like when I come out of prison, I sort of had that. What I sort of felt like I learned more about myself, like you said, and I upskilled. But then I also learned like I've got a family here and I've got a lot of connections. Like so I didn't mind going back. I didn't really give a shit if I went back and I said to myself, I wasn't going to go back. I planned not to go back, but I wouldn't have given a shit if I did. And at the same time, when I got back out onto the streets, I knew that because I always used to fight for myself anyway, I didn't care about any other people, but I knew that if shit hit the fan, like I could call someone up from Birmingham or Manchester or somewhere and then have someone dealt with if I needed them to be dealt with. And that's the sort of lifestyle that that you end up in, isn't it? Especially yeah. like when you've been brought up around such violence and on the streets. And it is, uh, as the years have gone on, it's gone more violent out there, haven't it? And the kids now getting younger and younger. 
yeah. got to get involved in this stuff now. Like I was, I was young when I got involved in it. And it took me until I was 38 to sort my life out. Do you know what I mean? And I suppose it's probably similar for you as well. It took a long time to to sort your shit out, like, and realise that that's time. not going to work for you no more. You need to change yeah. things, isn't it? Mm. Um, it does take a long time, doesn't it, to kind of get through it. Yeah. it. It's not a quick fix, you know. You have got to work so hard to get back where you want to be, you know, and it is a, it's a long journey. Very long Definitely. journey. I think. It's, I'm happy you said that. Happy you said that because I still feel like I'm learning now, and yeah. um, I, I like I'm 36 now, and I look at a lot of people, and they seem to have got their shit together, and I'm like, fuck me, like, yeah, like, what am I, am I actually gonna get there? Like, that's um, what I felt like for a long time, yeah. and it's the thought I'm like, oh shit, I need to get my shit together, like, pay off all my debts from that life. And try and get a mortgage before I'm too late. Like, how am I going to get a 25 year mortgage when I only got 23 years left of working? And I'm like, I've ruined everything because I've waited so long. So you still have that time now. You know I mean, I didn't start sort of my life until I was 38. No, I, I, I understand. Like, I've, 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 I've had money problems, but I think a lot, like, money for me wasn't an issue a few years ago. Money wasn't an issue when I was selling drugs and stuff and whatnot. But, money has been an issue like i've been stupid enough to lend money out and i've paid the price for it and stuff like that and yeah i think i've i've gone from the to i've gone i go i'm like a very extreme person so like i go from being too nice and there's no middle ground so i'll be too nice or then i'll switch and then you'll see the complete I'd tear someone's face off. Like, it, there's no, like, I it's, it's very hard for me to meet in the middle. And is that down to, like, have you been diagnosed with any mental health conditions or anything? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah and so, it, only if you're happy mentioning them, but. Yeah. No, I don't mind. So, recently, I've got an assessment for ADHD, which I know I've I've always had. My family yeah. always said that I've got ADHD. Um, I've got complex trauma disorder um, and I've got a autistic syndrome disorder. I'm epileptic and I've got anxiety and depression. So I'm like a fucking walk-in. Um, I'm a walk-in prescription. So my partner, my girlfriend, she's um, really into her meditation and she's into these positive vibe shit. Even though I am, yeah, yeah, I am. She she'll say that I'm grumpy as fuck. I probably am grumpy, but I do. I am very much. I love the sort of way of healing yourself through like, um, through like your own mental state. So like with like crystals and. Um, just like to be one with like the sort of it sounds gay as fuck but like <laughs> <laughs> i know what you mean though it's just that calm and that still yeah. Yeah. And, and that peace in that moment like and yeah. it's nice and I, isn't it and i had that over covid to be fair so i was very much because everyone was in the same situation as me so like even the rich people were in the same situation as me so like i my business my new generation coach i hate calling it a business my organization at the time had ceased to exist i'd lost my job i'd lost um i'd broken up with um the mother of my daughter and had a car crash and that all happened within a week but because everyone was locked at home and couldn't do anything i sort of re-established myself at the time so i was like Everyone was doing what I was doing, and and it was nice weather, and I just sort of like was at peace um, over a period. But then I think after a certain amount of time, it started getting to me, and then. So oh, yeah. taking us back a little bit, mm. Um, mm. so you've experienced significant challenges, including involvement with knife crime, violence, and drug abuse. How did you find the strength to break away from that lifestyle in the first place and seek a new path? Like, and how did you end up then with new generation? Um, I think 
the birth of my twins was the start of um, me sort of wanting to turn. I always wanted to turn. I always, from the day I met, when the day I left prison, I was always determined to um, sort of turn my life around. I wouldn't even call it turn my life around because I didn't think of it turning my life around. I just wanted better for myself. Um, and then the birth and the constant people trying to put me down and say that I ain't going to amount to shit and all this and you're just going to end up like this and that. So I sort of use that as um, a bit of um, a bit of a like it was like a bit of a challenge like when someone challenges me to something I'm always wanting to to beat them um, and then the birth of my twins was another sort of step in stone and then I think the new generation coaching all stemmed from me wanting to I was working in a children's care home and I was doing two two on four off and I was thinking, what the fuck am I going to do with it? What I've been there for a year or two years at the time. What can I do with my four days off? Um, and I had um, my personal training qualifications. Um, I had other qualifications. I obviously had my working level three working with young people qualifications and the idea was given to me about like, why don't you use your sort of experience and your personal training into like trying to help young people and that. And that's where it sort of, sort of ended up coming from, really. I just didn't know what to do. And then becoming self-employed was another sort of massive step for me because I didn't know how to sort my taxes out and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then it sort of stemmed from there, and it's it's gone from strength to strength. I've gone through a massive struggle, like for over, like I've gone through struggles with new generation coaching, um, but I'm still here with new generation coaching, and it's not, not going to leave. I've your got- your organisation and new generation coaching, it aims to coach, deliver motivational talks, and mentor young people at risk of knife crime or disengage from school. So what message of hope do you convey to these young individuals and how do you inspire them to make positive changes in their life? I think I scare them at first, maybe. Ah. Um, I sort of give them facts of what's not just my life experiences, but what's going on in the world, because I think a lot of young people just live in a a bubble um, and don't realise that the stuff that's going on is real um and if they do think it's real they just think it's for shits and shits and giggles um but then i talk about the mental health side of things like it's effect like i i've got mental health issues and i've had mental health issues possibly since i was a kid from the age of eight and i'm now 36 and i do try and explain to the young people that these mental health, if you do not kick these habits that you that you do, yeah, these mental health issues will co- will stay with you for longer and longer. Um, and obviously I show things that I do now um, and where I am now. Um, I wouldn't say I'm in the, I will always say I'm never in the best position. Um, I think I'm very good at self-sabotaging a lot of things and very good at I don't need someone else to tell me I'm doing shit because I, even if I'm doing really well, I'll tell someone that I'm doing shit anyway. Do you um, have imposter syndrome? Possibly, possibly yeah. <laughs> no, it's hard, isn't it? Right. It is because I, I felt it myself when I went into work and it's like you you never think of yourself of like years ago when you were in that life, you would never have seen yourself in this no. life, would you? So now you're in it, it's hard and it's like, shit, am I meant to be here? Like... Uh, how do people see me how are people reacting to me and sometimes you just feel odd don't you and it takes a while before you can be yourself yeah definitely so like I I still feel very like I feel good but going back to like talking to the kids I feel 
I just explained to them, like, I'm here and I'm doing, like, okay. And these are the stuff that I'm doing. But at the same time, if you stop what you're doing at an early age, like, you pop... That I always say that they can do better than what I'm doing because they can. Yeah. And, and that's what I inspire them to do. Like, they, they're... I look at them as like the like as I call it the new generation. So that this new generation, I feel, can inspire inspire so many um, other people into um, doing great things. Um, I'm just there to remind them that they're great people. I don't yeah. think I, I think that's what I'm there for, just to remind them that if their parents or their so their foster parents or um, their their parents, i.e., like little kids, the guardians, like, yeah, yeah, they're, they're they're not giving them what they need. At least someone else is there to tell them, like they're 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 they're, look, they're looked at and they're they're special, like they're seen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's mad, like how powerful that having just that one person and that mentor and that mm-hmm. someone to look up to or someone to go to when you need to speak like how important that is for someone so young because you don't want people fighting battles in their heads mm-hmm. or talking to other young people on the street for advice as well do you know what I mean because they're not yeah. going to get the right advice are they so that's how why it's important for people like us who have been and made them mistakes in life to now you know show it educate show the them. new generation yes. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah, I think that's absolutely amazing. But um, during the COVID-19 lockdowns, you mentioned that your mental health uh, took a turn for the worst and the past was pulling you back. What strategies or support did you seek to overcome these obstacles and get back on track? I actually did. I had. I was going through a thing called transactional analysis therapy, um, and that's based around someone that's got they think it works for people that are autistic so I was going through that um counseling but that ended um relatively quickly during the covid time um what got me back on track was I was actually in a friend's house and he was owed a lot of money and there was a shotgun sort of involved and I had an email and an email sort of sent to me um, and I had been nominated for uh, NDA award which is a national diversity award and it was like a penny drop moment I was like involved I was going back because at the time I hadn't seen my daughter for like three months um, and my place looks like a shrine of my daughter. So, like, every day I was looking at pictures and stuff. Um, I was on a police charge as well. And um, I really, at the at the time, just really didn't give a shit. And I was like, I'm just, if I can make money and if I can go, I'll go back to the same old life. And then I had that email and that was sort of a, penny drop moment and that sort of brought me back out of a situation that could have turned escalated yeah yeah so that was that's it's mad because like lockdown and and that COVID-19 time had such an impact on everyone else's life it was such a struggle and even people who weren't involved in drugs or in stuff ended up all mental health do you know what I mean there was a lot of it that occurred during lockdown and people did take this path like there was money issues there was everything else you know there was people losing their jobs and being furloughed and you know what I mean crime did rise yeah and it's easy when in a situation like that when you're isolated and and the world's not running properly to fall back into them bad habits especially when that's why you've known for for most of your life in it because I know when I relapsed I was clean for 10 years and as soon as I had the trauma I reverted back to that old behavior because I hadn't learned and I hadn't like done that full that self-discovery on myself you know what I mean so straight away I reverted back yeah that's yeah it's um it's just an easy way to do it. It's just an easy thing for us to do, isn't it? When um, you've lived a life of the same 
same. Like, if you live the life of knowing that, like, a positive thing, like, I don't know, just, I don't even know how to put it into words, but if you've just lived a life of knowing that violence, drugs, alcohol, sex is just, that's, and you've learnt that from a very young age, up until, like, your 20s, your mid-20s, your early 30s, like, it's going to take a long time for you to sort of get out of that situation or all that mentality because you just think it's normal. Yeah, definitely. And they're, they're behaviours that you learn and habits that you learn, aren't they? So, like, them habits are not the easiest to break. And then it's trying to set new habits and, you know, realigning yourself with the path that you want to take, isn't it? And it's, yeah. it is it takes a few different tries because you just have to find the right path yes. for yourself, don't you? Yeah, definitely. I um, I think my my missus at the at, at the moment she's she's like at my rock, but she struggles and because uh, I have many outbursts, I don't ever lay my hands on her or anything like that. But like I have my meltdowns, I have like my flip outs and. Like, I, I even try and f re remember what my counsellor tells me about walking out the house and giving yourself five minutes. Yeah. And they, it works, but she's it's like... It's important. That it is. is important, but she looks and is like, why are you walking out the house for? Why are you, like, walking away from me? And I'm like, this is what I've been told I need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's hard sometimes it for the other people to understand, isn't it? But within yeah. time and everything, do you know what I mean? And and it starts becoming a routine and it starts working for you. And just having that bit of space to have that breather. And you've you've recognised that. So that, yeah. that's another learned behaviour you've learned. You've recognised your behaviour and you've put something in place to, to mitigate that, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I I am... Um, I, I thought I was always told, like I, I had an auntie that wasn't my auntie. As I don't know whether any of you two had like an uncle or auntie that you called your auntie or uncle, but they weren't actually blood related. Yeah. Um, but she always told me, and even my actual auntie Michelle, she always said that I was a very happy, like smiley kid, and always yeah. running around and stuff. Obviously, up until a certain age where things started going downhill but I look at myself and think if that's the person I was born like if you're born that way and I was happy and smiley and whatnot the, well that's the person I am like not this person that I've been molded into yeah. uh, so I try and think that in my head that the person that I am or have been isn't actually isn't actually myself and it's not because like when you take drugs and stuff and, and you're around violence and stuff like your whole brain changes do you know what I mean and your behavior system changes and the way you react to things change and they're all learned behaviors that you don't realize yeah. you're learning but they're slowly instilled in you over the years aren't they and yeah. that's all you know then so like that's to, and then to realize like when you get that self-realization you know that that's not you like I look back on my years as addiction and I'm so I feel like I'm disconnected like I got yeah. somebody else's memories in my life and I think I can't believe I done that I can't believe like I done some of the things it did or like how I let my looks go or my hygiene go and things like that do you know what I mean and it doesn't feel levels. like because me today I wouldn't let that happen no so it's hard it's hard to look back on it because and I do feel very disconnected from that so do you feel like, do you feel like I feel very distant in terms of like, I, I feel like this is a conversation I had with my psychologist um, the other week. Um, I feel very disconnected to people where like, I don't, um, I look at like people in relationships or just friends and stuff, but I'm very much like, I'm very disconnected from like even trying to grow to have a relationship like my best mate me and him he knows me f like inside out so we but like I've known him for 23 years 24 years and he's my best mate but I've only met I've only seen him like three or four times in about five years 
So like, yeah, and I I am like that, like with all my old friends, like I pop in and see them every now and again, but I am very yeah. disconnected from them. And unless it's like re, I don't bother with no one else. So I mean, I go to work, I come home, I close my door. And it's yeah. like, I know I'm in my, this is my safe space now, my home, whereas years ago, it used to be everybody come in my house, everybody using drugs. Oh, you'd be you know I mean, nobody time. even knows where I live so they, except me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? My mum have only been to my house once. You know what I mean? This is my safe space and nobody knows where I am. And that's the way I like to keep it. And I come home, I shut my door, I put my telly yeah. on, I do my housework, my cooking, and I'm done for the night. And I keep myself to myself. That's and like I have my me. social media and I chat to read. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And and that's it. I keep my bubble small these days because I know what it's like being out there. And it is hard to trust people. You know, you don't know whether you're around the right people and you're still trying to protect yourself from those mistakes that you used to make and you don't want to make them again so it's easier to just keep yourself in sometimes and just concentrate yeah. on your work and your passions isn't it yeah definitely yeah. That's so as someone who's faced significant setbacks what advice do you have for others who may be struggling with their mental health or facing challenges and turning their life around seek help straight away no like, yes. yeah you'd, i think the longer you leave it like i said before the longer you leave it the the harder it will get um and it it does get harder um masking it with drugs and alcohol does not work whatsoever it's it's a quick fix it's not even a fix it's just a it's just a covering up a, yeah it's like a plaster in it you're just covering up a wound but but not if your wound's that deep a plaster's not going to fix it so like um you need to seek help straight away and it took me years to seek help um i was in my mid-20s so i've i again was stupid and stubborn because i didn't seek help quick enough so my advice would be seek help and obviously find people you can find people online facebook i'm not on facebook but like facebook instagram linkedin there are people that have lived like yourselves lived and have had lived experiences so we're probably the best people to speak to uh, obviously professionals but you need it's you need help and you do and you need people around you that's understanding like them thoughts and them feelings you're having and not making you feel like there's something wrong with you for having them because somebody who doesn't have lived experience doesn't truly understand they might no, have a concept yes. but they don't truly yeah. understand the feelings and the thoughts and everything else that go with it and it that's that is the beauty of lived experience because yes. we have experience that we can understand and yeah. understand where they're coming from in it so definitely like listen to the people that have been there before you yes. and definitely seek help I think yeah. that, like, you know, it's it's really powerful for us to be helping people that have gone through stuff and we can relate to them as well. And, you know, I think that's really powerful. Really? But well, looking ahead, what are your goals and aspirations for the future, both personal, personally and with your organisation impacts on the community? Um, I might, I'm, I'm, tr I'm, tr I want a book. Um, so the future is to get a book out. Um, I'm, sort of um doing a funding thing for my um my book to get published i'm in the process of um of a woman that i sort of work for as an external sort of agency for the young carers they're looking at doing a tandem skydive so i can try and get this book published i want to yes. be i want a film eventually there's i've got goals and aspirations of building my own sort of having a new generation coaching sort of school um but that's that's a dream that's a pipeline dream and um i hope that one day i win the lottery and i'll be able to afford it um and then yeah it's like the normal things i I'd, um obviously i've got a partner and i'm hoping to get married and do all that stuff <laughs> yeah well that's it isn't it it's all like a work in progress but having them dreams and them aspirations and them goals is what's most important because if you don't have things to aim for like what are you going to do in it and if you keep 
working towards them goals and aspirations and you will get there and you might not need to win the lottery you might get funding from somewhere off the lottery or something yeah. do you know what I mean you never know but yeah. you keep working on yourself and working on your organization and like there is there's no better person out there than somebody who's been through the stuff that you've been through to actually coach these kids and show them like don't make this mistake don't make that mistake and yeah. you know look what happened to me don't go down that path and yeah. it's them type of people that's needed. These kids need to listen to people who have been through it and know where their life could end up. So lastly, what message would you like to leave our listeners with, especially those who may be going through some challenging times and maybe need a glimmer of hope? Um, I think everyone struggles. I think the message is like talk to someone and talk to someone that you can trust. I think you I think um People struggle with talking. I still struggle now to this day in terms of like expressing how I'm feeling. But if if you know that if there's a person that you know that you're close to that you've got a connection with that you know that they've got your best interests, then speak to them and then see where you go from there in terms of like seeking help and stuff. Um, because I know how hard it is when you when you're living a life where you've actually got family members or parents that are sort of causing that situation and sort of certain people that you're friends with that are causing that they're all causing that situation you have to try and seek help from somewhere else and I think obviously your podcast if people are listening to your podcast and they know that they can seek help through yourselves or or myself or other people that you've spoken to on your podcast definitely and that's what we're here for isn't it is to show people that obviously people you can turn your life around yeah. do you know what I mean obviously there's a lot of work and a, a lot of dedication, and and <laughs> yeah. dedication and you know it does take a while but it's doable it's definitely doable if we can do it everybody else can do it that's why I say if I can do it you can do it that's yeah. right yeah, it's just, it's just finding the way that works for you, isn't it? Yeah. And that's usually what's the challenging part is stopping and starting and finding the right thing that works exactly. for you. It's just about self-discovery, isn't it? And growing yourself again yeah. and learning about who you truly are and not yeah. the person you was moulded into. Definitely, 100%. So yeah. on that amazing note, we would like to thank Benny for his honest and open sharing of his story today. And a huge thanks to our viewers and our subscribers and everyone who's tuned into this episode of Hashtag Tell Me Your Story. And don't forget to like and share and subscribe. Bye.